I see myself as an artist who happens to be black in a society that believes in race. My work takes a look at the pathology of white supremacy and trying to use photography, imagery, art as a way of exploring the realities of that predicament. When Michael Brown was murdered in 2014 by Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri, his body being on Canfield Drive, the police leaving that out for everyone in that community to see. I saw a history of spectacle lynching. And I knew in that moment that I could no longer work inside of that system. The camera showing up in that process, making these images that then go on to be used as a way of shaming black people, trying to remind us of the hierarchy that white people have created, the things that they want us to believe about ourselves. The image can enforce those beliefs, can perpetuate those beliefs and those actions. That is really what opened my eyes to the realities of what I was trying to say with my art. I wanted to consider the many different levels of structural violence, but then also by making pictures of people in this place where they've experienced oppression by the police, they've experienced segregation, but they've also survived it and found ways of living life. And to me, that's like essential to, to black life in America. Like we're always trying to find our way in spite of you know, the history that we've experienced in this country. My first body of work, Corrections, was working with kids in the juvenile criminal justice system. I became more and more aware of that photography exists inside of that system as a means for categorizing and stigmatizing people. first time that I went into a portrait session with a kid, knowing intentionally that I was not going to um, you know, make an image with, with uh, his face present. I'm standing there, fumbling with my camera, trying to figure out like, what am I going to do? And he had reached up to scratch the back of his neck. It created this negotiation between us and made me ask questions of like, how would you like to be seen in this picture? That anonymity, it's removing an aspect of the person, something similar to what the system does. But then these other pieces started to fill in that absence. I was reading a report about the school to prison pipeline and seeing these statistics, it hit me that this percentage point is this individual I just dropped off at school this morning. That revelation was what sold me on art as the path for me. I think that's where my voice is the loudest and most clear. At No Point In Between takes place in North Omaha, Nebraska. There's a lot of vacant lots, a lot of condemned buildings and homes. In the 1930s, the federal government started delving into the practice of redlining, which is government-endorsed segregation, done through this process of trying to determine the value of land. A neighborhood like Omaha would be given a D rating on a redlining map because it is a predominantly black neighborhood. Therefore, it has less value. So investors are discouraged by this grade to not invest there. The North Freeway was built through the neighborhood. It was originally slated to be built through a white neighborhood. White people were, of course, like, we can't have that. Build it through the black neighborhood. And the city's like, OK, we got you. And they build it through the black neighborhood. When the freeway was built, you have this mass exodus of people from the neighborhood. So things get abandoned. All of the businesses that were there, their patronage goes down. 
the community is so economically disenfranchised, this like snowball effect created by policy and infrastructure. So to me, like there is no difference between a spectacle lynching and redlining. It's just another means to the same end. I grew up in poverty, I was poor through my mid to late 20s. Getting a teaching job, having some success in the art world. I've recently experienced like a socioeconomic jump. In that portrait in particular, I was thinking about this class jumping and the relationship of it to my racial identity. I mean, it was like, yeah, the audacity of this black man to drive a seven series. It's like, I can transcend all of these boundaries, but my racial identity, um, you know, like is, is something that's always going to be used to keep me in a particular place, so to speak. I'm put on this foil grill, I'm bare chested and I have this chain on. I'm thinking about the performance of masculinity as just like a tangible piece of black culture. You know, the grill is, is a rather significant kind of marker. It's, it's almost this way of, of donning this kind of armor. Um, and it just looks really cool, man. <laughs> it looks fly. <laughs> American Mother, American Father is me trying to undo the knots of marginalization that have been done to me. We drove to Mississippi uh, to see my dad, and it was the first time that I had seen him in about 10 years. He left when I was, um, I think like five or six. We've had this very like disjointed and disconnected relationship, you know, to the point where we're complete strangers. The only goal that I had was to make a portrait of him. There was a lot of fear that I, I was holding on to. Is he going to accept me? You know, I pull up to his house and he opens the door. Like we just immediately hugged and it was that feeling of like unconditional love. He's done some pretty terrible things in his life, uh, you know, like to our family and to other people. But I still hold like a level of love for him because he was one of the first people who taught me how to love. And all of that was really profound and I think unlocked a lot of doors for me. It helped me feel okay in being vulnerable. I think they're maybe most proud of me leading a life that I want to live and on my own terms because they both led lives that like and in times like where that just wasn't possible and so I think that they're just happy that you know I am I'm successful in what I do but that ultimately I'm happy in what I do. So this is uh, True Colors or Affirmations in a Crisis. I describe it as a manual for coming to terms with being black in America. The structure of the book is like me retelling like specific parts of my life. Like those inner workings are, are exposed and like meant to be exposed. This is the first self-portrait I ever made in uh, my first beginning photography class. The work like literally spans my entire career. I often joke that it's, um, that the book is me giving myself um, an early career retrospective. Again, connecting past and present. So this is, uh, you know, Watts riots in the 90s, um, the riots uh, um, in Minnesota after George Floyd was murdered. This idea of like being critical 
about images that we see. So this is a statue of Christopher Columbus in uh, Syracuse, New York, and where he's like, you know, quite literally standing on the lopped off heads of indigenous individuals. When we see images like this in public spaces, what is that telling us about the value systems of our society? So this is really special uh, little spread too. So uh, another gatefold, but it opens up and on the inside, uh, these are uh, lyrics to a rap track uh, written by uh, one of my former grads, Tay Butler. According to Leslie Martin at Aperture, this is the first time a rap track has been embedded into a, an Aperture book. Um, so this is literally, this book is quite literally history. And then we get to this moment where I'm like waking up to the realities of the world and then deciding to do something about it for myself. Um, and so this section is titled Liberation. I recognize that like my lived experience is one of the greatest co conspiracy theories of all time. You know, blackness in America, um, anti-black violence and oppression. Um, yeah, it's like the greatest conspiracy ever dreamed up. So whether we're thinking about slavery, whether we're thinking about incarceration, whether we're thinking about spectacle lynching, whether we're thinking about the redlining of the neighborhood, to me, those are all synonymous. You know, it's, it's um, black genocide. Things won't change until there is a critical mass of us asking the same questions, pushing for the same rights. If my art could do all of the things that I wanted it to do, to create a world where I felt that I could live at ease, it would no longer be necessary for it to exist. <laughs>